Welcome back, pet parent. So this is a topic that comes around every single year, and that is fleas. And we are getting ready to head into flea season. We're very quickly approaching spring. So we're, we're going to be, everybody is going to be talking about fleas, ticks, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes tend to come a little bit, maybe a little bit later after fleas, but Still, we're going to be talking about all of these things very, very soon. And it's really important to know what you're going to do, to have a plan put in place because you don't want to be caught off guard with a house full of fleas. So today we're going to be talking about a little bit about the flea cycle so we can under, better understand what we're actually dealing with. We're also going to talk about what to do when you find fleas on your pet and possibly most importantly, the number one thing you can do to keep your pet in your house flea free. So let's get into it. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Okay, so this topic is not new, but it is worth repeating because we go through it every single year. It is cyclical. And every single year we have people who are like, ah, oh my gosh, they've been caught off guard. Now their pet has fleas. Now there are fleas in their house. So I found this really, really great blog post by Dr. Karen Becker on Bark and Whiskers. So if you're new to following Dr. Dr. Karen Becker, Great. If you've been following her for a while, you may or may not know that they changed the Mercola Healthy Pets site to BarkAndWhiskers.com. So this is a newer post that she put up on the Bark and Whiskers uh, blog. And I'm going to interject some things along the way because, again, this is not a new topic to discuss, but a very important one because... It is most important to be proactive. We don't want to be putting chemical flea and tick treatments on our pets. These are neurotoxins. They, in my opinion, do more harm than good. And yes, this is something that you do want to look at on a case-by-case -case basis. Every animal, every situation is an individual. So I think more the situation can be a determining factor more so than the animal because why would we ever want to put a neurotoxin on our animals intentionally? So maybe the situation that you're in is going to require some, some decisions that you would otherwise not make. But in most cases, there are plenty of things we can do to get around putting these nasty, in my opinion, horrendous neurotoxins on our pets. So let's get into it. Okay. So I am going to reference Dr. Karen Becker's article when talking about the life cycle of a flea. This is something that I don't think I have covered before. So I'm going to let her cover it much better than I ever could. Fleas have four stages in their life cycle. The first stage is egg. So adult fleas lay eggs on your pet from 20 to 28 eggs per day. These eggs drop off of your dog or cat and grow wherever they land, which is often your furniture, carpets, throw rugs, and other flooring. Stage two is the larva stage. This is what the egg turns into, little worm-like creatures. Larva hatch from flea eggs. Stage three is the pupa. The larva forms a pupa a cocoon of sorts inside which it moves through additional growth stages that can take anywhere from about 10 days all the way up to 200 days to complete. And stage four is the adult life cycle of a flea. Adult fleas are what the pupae evolve to and they're what you see on your pet. So the tiny little black things that jump 
or brown. Sometimes they're browner. It depends on your lighting, I suppose. They live on an average about six weeks, but they can live much longer. The only way to remove adult fleas from their natural habitat, your dog or cat, is to kill them or pick them off. So I'm going to interject here about those topical or even oral um, neurotoxins. That's what they are. So that's why I call them that, that we call flea and tick meds. How do they actually work? So you give it to your pet, whether you put it on their skin between their shoulder blades or you give it to them in a chew. I can't tell you, by the way, how many people I have talked to that their dog is refusing to eat these chews, whether it's a flea and tick or a heartworm or a combo of all of the above, their dogs don't want to eat them and they're dumbfounded. They're like, why not? Well, you're feeding, you're literally feeding them poison. It is 100% like every cell in their body is saying, do not eat poison. Don't do it. And so it makes complete sense to me because I understand what it is, but a lot of people don't understand what it is. So they're confused as to why their pet would be refusing to eat. They have, it's like a struggle every month or two months or however often you're giving this to your pet. And there is a very good reason if you're using the topical flea and tick um, preventative, which I say in quote, like my little quote, quote fingers, there is a reason that that package insert says don't touch your pet and certainly do not let your children touch your pet after application for a certain period of time. These are very harmful neurotoxic chemicals and they can do damage to us, to our children. They are doing damage to our pets. Sadly, too many dogs and cats have suffered from seizures, other neurological disorders, up to and including death from these very, very toxic neurochemicals. And I'm not like, if this has not happened to your dog yet, count your blessings, literally count your blessings because it happens far too often with too many animals. And the way these things work, this is how I got started on this topic. The way these things work is that you're putting the poison into your dog's bloodstream, whether that's topically or through an oral pill. You're putting poison in their bloodstream. So it is not preventing anything. It is not preventing fleas from biting. It is not preventing ticks from latching on. It is not preventing mosquitoes from biting. What it is doing is when a flea bites or when a tick latches on or when um, a mosquito bites your pet, they ingest the blood containing the poison from your pet and that then kills them. So it is not preventing anything. It is, your pet is still, maybe they are less likely to be infested because it is killing, or maybe you're less likely to see an infestation because it is killing the pests that may be um, attacking your pet. But it's not preventing anything. They are not preventatives. So let's get back to Dr. Karen Becker's article. Most of the fleas in your environment are not on your pet. Fleas reproduce at an astonishing rate. I think we can all attest to that. <laughs> 10 female fleas can produce over 250,000 more fleas in a single month. And believe it or not, the adult fleas riding around on your pet are only about 5% of the fleas in your living environment. That means 95% of the fleas in your house are everywhere but on your pet. Flea eggs are most often found in carpets, bedding, floorboards, and soil. Flea larvae and pupae are found where your dog or cat spends most of their time, including their bedding, in carpets and area rugs, on upholstered furniture, on your bedding, or wherever else your pet hangs out because again, your pet is their food source. There is one other important note that Dr. Karen Becker has in her blog and I want to read it now because I think so more and more and more 
animals I see are experiencing this. She says, it's also important to note that intermittent flea exposure increases your pet's risk for flea allergy dermatitis, FAD, which is an allergic hypersensitive reaction to the presence of fleas. And sometimes just a single flea can trigger flea allergy dermatitis. So I said we were going to talk a little bit about assessing the risk to your pet, right? And of course, if you live in a warmer climate, that is one of the top risk factors. Uh, But what I will tell you is that I live in central Texas. I live in, I mean, it is just, of course, we're going to have fleas. We have ticks. We have mosquitoes. And I hit my mic with my hand. Did you hear that? I don't know. (laughs) I will find out during the editing process. Anyway, um, we absolutely have all of these pests and more. And I have been very successful in keeping my dog and my cats free of these chemical neurotoxins. And we haven't had a problem. I'm going to knock on wood because I do think that while I have done a lot to prepare my pets, my home, my yard, my mindset, there's always a little bit of luck (laughs) that goes into, um, you know, we, we've been flea free. And again, I'm going to knock on wood because I think that's it. That's, I I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it. I know that I am doing everything I possibly can to protect my pets and to keep them in a, a situation where they are not an ideal host for these parasites. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute, but I want to talk about what do you do if you do find fleas on your pet? Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Okay, so going back to Dr. Karen Becker's article, what to do if you find fleas on your pet. The best way to prevent a flea infestation is to proactively check for fleas daily during flea season. Removing a few fleas is a whole lot easier than fighting hundreds, which can occur quickly if you're not checking daily. If you find a few fleas on your pet, don't panic. Instead, grab a flea comb and start combing. It is the best defense there is. Your dog or cat should be combed at least once daily with the flea comb. Place her on a light colored towel to catch any fleas that fall off and dip the comb into a bowl of soapy water after each swipe. Flush the contents down the toilet when you're done. Bathe her frequently until the fleas are gone as fleas are less attracted to clean animals and drown like any other creature when submerged underwater. She says, remember, fleas on your pet means fleas in your house. Vacuum all the areas of your home your pet has access to. Vacuum the carpet, area rugs, bare floors, upholstered furniture, pillows, your pet's bedding, and even your own Um, your own bed, wherever your pet sleeps with you. Use the crevice tool and other attachments to vacuum along the baseboards and around the corners and edges of furniture. Don't forget to vacuum hard to reach places like under the furniture, under beds and closet floors. Dump the contents of your vacuum, vacuum into a sealed bag and leave it outside of your house. If it makes sense, designate a single sleeping area for your pet that one would be hard for me, Um, one you can clean easily. Please accumulate in pet sleeping spaces. So if you can limit those, it will be easier to control the situation. Your dog's or cat's bedding should be vacuumed daily and washed frequently. 
You can apply a light dusting of food grade dimetaceous earth, DE, on your carpets, bare floors, and pet bedding. Make sure the DE is food grade, not pool filter grade, which is toxic if ingested. Like dimetaceous earth, cedar oil, another all natural insect repellent can be applied to your environment and pet bedding, as well as directly on your dog or cat. I'm going to make a couple of notes here. So I'm going to pull away from her, her blog post, but one thing about dimetaceous earth that you do need to know is that you still, because these particles are so tiny, they are easily inhaled. You do not want to allow your pet to breathe in the dimetaceous earth. So I would recommend, especially if you're going to do um, like one room at a time, or even when you're putting it on your pet, be very careful. I would do it in a very well ventilated space so that your pet and yourself are not breathing it in, even with the food grade. That's one thing. Another thing with the cedar oil that she is talking about, you do want to use a very high quality oil if you're going to be using it, especially if you're going to be using it directly on your pet. Um, one company that I love is Wonderside. Another one is Animalio. So Animalio is going to make, first they have a flea bomb recipe, which is great. You can absolutely check that out. It's Animal EO. And anything I talk about today, I will link in the show notes, including this blog post. Um, I love Animalio. She has a flea bomb. She also has three, I believe it's three now, different blends for uh, bug repellents, evict, oust, and away. Now, one or two may work better for you than others, depending on where you live, because the different oils in these blends just may work better on the species that you have in your natural environment. So I would Try out all three, see what works best. I rotate between the three because I, one, love the way they smell and they each smell a little bit different. And I don't know about you, but for me, smells bring back memories. So they bring back memories of camping <laughs> with my dad when I was little, but they each smell a little bit differently because of the dominant oil in the blend. And I have found that they all work really, really well for me personally where I live. So those are a couple of things to keep in mind about the recommendations that she has. She also says, so I'm going to get back to her blog post now. You can also apply sodium polyborate powder or borax in hard to reach areas to get rid of fleas at the larval stage. Just be sure to keep pets and children out of the area while you're applying the product. Like DE, avoid inhaling the powder. Okay, so there she goes. <laughs> I was wondering if she was going to warn you about inhaling dimetaceous earth. We don't want to do that. Um, the powder works for a year once it's applied unless you have your carpets steam cleaned. So that's going to get rid of um, any, anything you've put on the carpet. So you might need to reapply it if you're still having issues. So non-toxic flea repellents. From Dr. Karen Becker. The time to deter fleas is before they become a problem. Amen. Before they become a problem. Yes. Apple cider vinegar, ACV, is one option to consider. And while it doesn't kill fleas, it does repel them. You can make a solution out of equal parts ACV and water. I recommend using a raw organic product. So with the apple cider vinegar, you want organic and with the mother, that's the best. Add the mixture to a spray bottle and spritz it on your pet. Avoid their face before he heads outdoors. You can also spray his bedding. To supercharge the spray and make it even more distasteful to fleas, add in a few drops of dog safe essential oils. Again, this is where I'm talking about the blends from Animalio. She's recommending geranium, lemongrass, lavender, neem, and catnip oils are all good that will help deter fleas as well as ticks, mosquitoes, and other pests from your pet. I, uh, she uses 10 drops for every eight ounces of spray. So there are a bunch of really great essential oils, again, as long as they are high quality, which is why I only recommend Animalio because they are the only veterinary grade essential oils on the market. You can also add ACV to your pet's food. I use about one teaspoon per 20 pounds of dog. Most dogs don't like the taste 
of water with ACV. So I don't recommend adding it because it could cause your pet to consume less water. So don't put it in their water. Another option is to pour diluted ACV over a freshly bathed dog. Add one cup of ACV to one gallon of water and pour it over your dog while he's still wet. Massage the solution into his coat, don't rinse, and towel him dry. Then finish off with a light dusting of food grade diametaceous earth down your dog's back, avoiding their face, which provides extra protection during the worst weeks of flea season. Flea comb after every outdoor excursion during flea season. So here's the good part. Here's the part that I've been waiting on because this is what I have been preaching for years now. <laughs> and this is how the absolute hands down best way to keep your pet safe from fleas and ticks and mosquitoes and literally as best you can from any other parasite you can think of because we want to make our pets the most unattractive host. If they're not a good host, then the parasites have no reason to be there. So let's start with what Dr. Karen Becker says, and then we'll go from there. A healthy pet naturally repels fleas. Yes. Amen. Preach, preach, preach. A healthy pet naturally repels fleas. Think about it before I go into what she wrote. And it's just, it's, it's a short little snippet. When you think of dogs in the wild or a wolf pack in the wild, you're not often, like if, if you see a group of animals in the wild, yeah, you may see some pests. In general, you're not seeing the bulk, like you're not seeing the bulk of wolves in the wild keeling over from heartworm, right? It's not happening. Now, what you may see in that pack is that the elderly are the ones that are being attacked or the young, maybe their, their immune system is like really, really young. Their immune system isn't fully formed yet or an animal that is sick or diseased. The pests are attacking them primarily. That is because they, their immune system is not functioning well enough to repel them, to keep them away. So these are the ideal hosts for parasites. These vibrant, healthy, you know, beautiful looking wolves, they are not the ideal host. They have a strong immune system. They are eating their best, you know, the best food they can find. They are, you know, catching their prey and eating other healthy animals in the wild. And they are getting plenty of exercise. They're not overweight. They are not ideal hosts for these pests and parasites. So with that picture in mind, that picture in your head, I want to read what Dr. Becker says. It's extremely important to feed your dog or cat a nutritionally balanced, species-specific fresh food diet that will help keep his immune system functioning optimally. Most vets agree Fleas and other parasites are less attracted to healthy animals, and a vibrantly healthy body is less hospitable to parasite infestations. In fact, even within the same households, I have had animals repeatedly plagued with fleas, while other pets in the home have no issues. So working on your pet's individual immune system, including optimizing gut health, is important. Also provide pure drinking water and limit your pet's exposure to unnecessary vaccines, medications, environmental, environmental chemicals, including lawn chemicals and electromagnetic fields or EMFs. Oh, that was, that was good. I really enjoyed this article from her and I hope that you enjoyed all the little tidbits that I threw in there to go along with it because a healthy pet is not, as Karen Becker just said, is not a hospitable environment for these pests and parasites. I do everything I can in my power to keep my pet's immune systems at, in tip top shape. Now, <laughs> I'm going to be really honest with you here. While my dog, Kim, is eating, she eats a balanced raw food diet 
I rotate brands. I rotate proteins. She does a modified fast, meaning in the mornings for breakfast, she gets raw goat's milk, which is incredibly easily digestible. It is, even though it is providing nutrition to her body, her digestive system is not having to really function to digest everything. So it's a modified fast. So in the mornings, she gets the raw goat's milk. And in the evenings, once a day, she eats her meal. Um, she is nine years old. So she's not a puppy. Puppies do need to eat more often. Um, but in addition to that, she doesn't get unnecessary vaccines. I have her titer tested. Um, I had her titer tested. So I know she has adequate immunity levels. Uh, and that is, I, I had, I had to put in the work. I hoofed it and I called and I called. I probably called over 30, 30 veterinary offices when we moved trying to find a new veterinarian because, or at least a veterinary office that we could go to in conjunction with a holistic veterinarian who may not have an office here locally, because I needed to find a veterinary office that one, understood what a tire test was and two, accepted it in place of over-vaccination. And look, a lot of them don't. I get it. It's a problem. That's why we have to put in the work and the effort. And I did that and I found one. And it's not the most convenient. It's not the closest one to me, but it is what it is. And that's, that's what we do. Now, so she is not inundated with things she doesn't need. She, we do not put uh, chemicals on our, our lawn. I live in a community that has an HOA and I cannot control what they put um, on the common areas. So when we uh, take her for a walk in the neighborhood or anywhere we take her, she gets her feet cleaned as soon as we get home. And I just do everything I possibly can to keep her in tip-top shape. She gets uh, transfer factors from bovine colostrum, which is a product from Vengeance. It, it's like, I call it her multivitamin. That's what she gets every day. And I noticed a difference when I started giving it to her and I thought she was optimally vitally healthy before I gave it to her. After giving it to her, I realized she wasn't, <laughs> she was pretty darn good, but there was more that I could do. So with that, you know, we, I just do everything I can in my power. I keep my house clean. We have plant when I, I plant outside of my home is very intentional. I have a lot of catnip lavender, rosemary, because that is naturally, um, they naturally repel these pests. And where I said I was going to be very, very honest with you, I have not been as great with my cats. My cats don't go outside. Uh, and um, not that that is an excuse. Not, you know, I, I beat myself up on this all the time. Cats are just more difficult that when, when it comes to diet, because my cats were kibble fed for a long time because I didn't know better. I do have them on a wet food diet. So they eat canned wet food. I feed them the highest quality that they will eat. Um, that isn't, some of my cats won't eat it. Others, other of my cats will. So I do my best <laughs> with the ones that won't eat a higher quality to sneak it in every once in a while. My one saving grace, I think, for my cats that won't eat the high quality wet food, they will eat um, freeze dried raw. So my cats get freeze dried raw. And that has, in my opinion, been um, a, a little saving grace <laughs> for, for them. But they, they don't have the same exposure that my dog Kim does. Um, that's another saving grace for them, I think. But all of that said, I am doing my best to keep them as vitally healthy as I can. I think, I think absolutely I could do better for my cats. And I, and I try every day. Every single day I try with them. I try something different. I try something new. I try and I try and I try. And because it's, it's my responsibility to do so. I'm responsible for them. I am their caregiver. The other thing I do for Kim, uh, my dog, 
is every six months, not every year, every six months, I have her tested, uh, tested for heartworm because I want to make sure that we are doing everything possible to keep her healthy and to keep her free of heartworms. Um, but if she ever does test positive, I know it's not the end of the world. I know we're at the very beginning stages. I know that we can treat it naturally and I want to be on top of it and know immediately if something like that does happen with her. So I, I, I know that we're doing everything we can so far. So good. She has had all negative heartworm tests and um, I'm just thrilled that I'm doing everything I can to keep my pets vitally healthy. And that is the most important thing we can do to keep them free of pests and parasites. So I hope this was helpful. You're going to have to let me know. Reach out to me on socials. Instagram is my preferred contact method, but wherever you are, um, hopefully I'm there too. I do have Facebook and TikTok and um, I am on Twitter, though it's not much, but I, I'm there if you want to reach out to me there too. And let me know if this was helpful for you, if this was eye-opening, if you learned something new, or if this was just reaffirming. I would love to hear from you about it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for caring about your pets as much as I care about mine. And give your pets some extra love from me this week. Until next week, bye guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.